Thanks to Putin, even the New York Times begins to see the truth. I, uh, it, it's sad. I, I wish the Ukrainian civilians weren't the, uh, the, the cannon fodder because their government is so damn corrupt, uh, sponsored by the U.S. I mean, the Ukrainian government is essentially the United States puppet. It's sad. And the Ukrainian people are bearing the brunt of the United States foreign influence uh, for corruption. You know, the Fed, the Hunter Biden, the Joe Bidens, the John McCain's, the Lindsey Graham's. It's, it's just disgusting. And I have no, Putin is a scumbag too. They're all scumbags. At the end of the day, though, the least of the scumbags are my friend. In that case, the least of the scumbags, I'll let you figure that out. Uh, but but sadly, the world has been um, evil, or not the world, the EU, the green machine, the Davos crowd, the World Economic Forum, the United States has been evil to billions of poor people throughout the world by their demands that they give up their fossil fuels and never let them have fossil fuels to begin with. It's nuts. It's, it's freaking evil. We know for a fact when the leading causes of death in third world countries is lung cancer and lung disease. And we know why. It's because they're heating their homes, they're cooking their food with cow dung, with 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 wood. There's no filtering, there's no chimneys, and that's just the particles in the air is killing these people. It just it's freaking disgusting, man. So don't tell me you're all humanitarian while you're pushing the green. The green fascists are the biggest enemy of the world. There's no other way around that. And so seeing, unfortunately, it seems that unfortunate that a war had to happen in a war that European people uh, whites with the blonde hair and blue eyes because New York Times wouldn't care if it's in Africa or if it's in the Middle East, but because it's whites that look like us, uh, they take notice, which uh, which is sad. But hey, if that's a sacrifice for the greater good, I feel bad for the Ukrainians. You know, the Ukrainian people don't deserve this, but, uh, you know, that's a legacy of John McCain There's, and, and Joe Biden. No other way around it. It's disgusting, man. Anyway, so let's look at this right here. So my man, Michael, um, right here, Michael Schellenberger on uh, Substack. I, I think this is probably the most important graph you'll see all day. Pablo just went, where did Pablo go? He's under there. Oh, oh there he is. Right, let me pause it real quick. Here's my man, Michael Schellenberger. People think Europe depends on Russia for energy because it lacks its own. But 15 years ago, Europe exported more national gas than Russia does today. Now, Russia exports three times more gas than Europe produces. Why? Because climate activists partly funded by Russia blocked fracking. I, uh, I just, right there, and you can see it. Here's the European Union from 1990 to 2000, exporting of gas, natural gas. Look at that. I just, this freaking, it's, it's evil, man. Evil. The head of NATO, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and a French professor have all documented funding from Russia for anti-fracking activism in Europe. In 2014, NATO's uh, Secretary General revealed that Russia was funding climate activists, saying Russia engaged activity actively with so-called non-government organizations working against shale gas to maintain dependence on Russian gas. And no one listened. All right. So that's uh, that's an even freaking nuclear, uh, even my man, uh, Michael acknowledges that freaking this guy right here, Elon, is saying we got to go nuclear. All right, so let's just, this this right here just made me, maybe just, I, and again, I hate the fact that the Ukrainian people are the, uh, the cannon fodder for the evil that is the Western influence of the EU and the United States and all the green NGOs who don't care about individual people, depopulate. Just read the Georgia Guidestones. One of these days I'll go up there and show it to you. New York Times tiptoes towards energy reality. This debate is changing. Here's from the New York Times. Certainly, the path of energy transition has never been clear. Five climate summits have taken place over the past 30 years, and progress has always fallen short. This latest setback may just be the latest in a long series of halfway measures and setbacks. For critics of the EU's climate policies, this guy the sudden focus away from greenhouse gas emissions and on existing fuel reserves is validated. Yep. Let history note that the February 2022 print edition of New York Times admitted that net zero was a long shot. This breaks the narrative that net zero was the inevitable future with politics and business and high technology leading the way. Forget energy density. Energy reality would be remade by a shared narrative of hoping and want it to be remade. It's going to happen because we pull unicorns and can't cotton candy. 
The beginning of the end of the net zero mirage has launched. COP27 in nine months will confront a tripartite fossil fuel boom, as well as elections that will demote climate zealotry in the United States and around the world. Look, climate zealotry has been demoted for years in elections. You don't win up running on climate change. You don't. You can, I mean, maybe you can win the left primary, but I mean, those just people are just dumb. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. In the reality, though, people recognize, I don't want to pay more for, for the gasoline for the pump. That's just the pump of the gas. Never mind the heating oil and all that stuff that costs electricity. You know where electricity comes from, right? Great. Actually, let's just let's read some of this. Mainstream politically correct cancel culture leaders such as the New York Times ignored the warnings about how wind and solar were fickle energies to try to replace a real thing. The carbon-based mineral energies we take for granted. But the naysayers are just spouting off agenda-driven big oil drivel. Right? Wrong! What happened in Texas just over a year ago has been playing out in slow motion in the EU and the UK. Climate fears on back burner as fuel costs soar and Russia crisis deepens. It was only three months ago that the world leaders met the Glasgow Climate Summit and made ambitious pledges to reduce fossil fuels. The perils of a warming planet are no less calamitous now, but the debate about the critically important transition of renewable energy has taken a back seat as energy security in Russia threatens to start a major confrontation. For more than a decade, policy discussions in Europe and beyond cutting back on gas, oil, and coal emphasize safety and environment at the expense of financial and economic considerations. Yep. Gas prices became very high, and all of a sudden, security and supply and price became the main subject of public debate. That's weird, because uh, I could have sworn that Mr. Obama himself said we need higher gas prices. Let's take a look, shall we? Obama in 2007 during the campaign. You know, when I was asked earlier about the issue of coal, uh, you know, under my plan of a cap-and-trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. That's Obama. Electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket in 2008. Under my plan, uh, freaking scumbag. The renewed, uh, we already talked, the renewed emphasis on energy independence and national security may encourage policymakers to backslide on efforts to decrease the use of fossil fuels. Already skyrocketing prices have spurred additional production and consumption of fuels that contribute to global warming. Coal imports to the EU in January rose more than 56% from the previous year. In Britain, the Coal Authority gave a mine in Wales permission last month to increase output by 40 million tons over the next two decades. In Australia, there are plans to open or expand more coking coal mines. China, which has traditionally made energy security a priority, has further stepped up its coal production and approved three new billion-dollar coal mines this week. How Europeans are responding to high energy bills. Get your rig count up, says Jennifer Granholm, ah, the U.S. Energy Sec S Secretary who's laughing before about freaking high energy costs, urging American oil producers to raise their outputs. Shale companies in Oklahoma, Colorado, and other states are looking to resurrect drilling that ceased because they suddenly made can make money in this. And ExxonMobil announced plans to increase spending on new oil wells and other projects. High prices, more drilling, 100%. For Germany, dependency on Russian gas has been an integral part of its environmental blueprint for many years. Plans for the first direct pipeline between the two countries, Nord Stream 1, started in 1997. A leader in the push to reduce carbon emissions, Berlin has moved to shutter coal mines and nuclear power plants after the Fukushima nuclear plant uh, in Japan. The idea was that Russians would supply the gas needed fuel during the year-long transition to clean energy. Two-thirds of the gas Germany burned last year came from Russia. And the German green leaders are saying, uh, we're not going to sanction Russian oil and gas. Future plans for even more gas to, to be delivered through Nord Stream 2, a new pipeline, uh, is it going on in, in Germany. Now, they were, initially they said, no, we're not going to go through this. I guarantee you they're going to, though. Um, and here's the big one. On Tuesday, Putin re recognized two breakaway republics in Ukraine and mobilized forces. And Chancellor Schloss of Germany halted final regulatory review of the 11 billion pipeline. It's going to come. And it's going to come at, at the beck and call of Putin. Putin said, you don't want my gas? You don't need my gas. And Germany's like, please, Putin, we want your gas. I think it's fantastic. 
Certainly, the path of energy transition has never been clear. Five, we already talked about that. Um, a rising concern uh, that as, as Russians atta Russian attacks on Ukraine could cause dizzying, dizzying spikes in prices for energy. All right. The prices for oil aren't at the highest since 2014. Europe gets nearly 40% of its natural gas from Russia and is likely to be walloped with higher heating bills. Natural gas reserves are running low, and European leaders have accused Putin of reducing supplies to gain a political edge. Thank you, freaking idiots. Food prices. The Russia is the world's largest supplier of wheat, and together with Ukraine, accounts for nearly a total of a quarter of the total global exports. In countries like Egypt and Turkey, that grain of flow of grain makes up more than 70% of wheat imports. You think Russia is losing this? You do you? Shortages of essential metals, the price of palladium used in automated exhaust systems and mobile phones have been soaring among fears that Russia, the world's largest export of the metal, could be cut off from the global markets. Even in Germany, the progressive Greens have gained a more influential voice in the government. There's been a shift in tone, 100%. Um, I, I just, I could not be happier. So let's read. I want to show you something else here, too. So hold on just a second. Let's go to, let's see what old BlackRock is doing right now. Because we haven't checked in on BlackRock for a while. All right, so here we go. Here's Larry Fink. Uh, I'd love to see him in orange. Uh, so let's see if he's still talking about climate change. Um, because that's what the big deal was not too long ago. Inve yeah, investing in the net zero transition. I would love nothing better than BlackRock to go bankrupt. I think that'd be fantastic. Um, expanding voting choice for clients the road to net zero. Yeah, let's see. Uh, let's see there, Larry. Um, when was this written? Uh, we believe that transition net zero world is shared responsibility. Climate risk is investment risk. Uh, right here in 2021, we committed to supporting the goal of net zero greenhouse gas by 2050 or sooner. It'll never happen, you freaking clowns. It will never, ever happen. Uh, so I just want to ask Larry Fink, uh, look, you got the money to pay for your own high energy prices. Uh, do you have the money to pay for ours? Do you? You do. And uh, I'll tell you what, man, if I'm ever present, I'm coming after you, Larry Fink. We're going to tax the hell out of you guys because you're hurting innocent working people in America with your insanity. But yet you're so rich, you don't give a crap about anybody else. I guarantee you. How many? Does Larry Fink, let's take a look. Does Larry Fink have a private jet? Let's see. Larry Fink's $98 million Goldstream. Not even the most dis desultory, I don't even know what that means, consumer of our financial press could have missed the arrival in Australia of Larry Fink, the big daddy of global asset management with a ludicrous $11 trillion under management. Uh, it's uh, Larry holds court, Australia's top CEO's deal and tactful obese whatever that word is, and then think no more of him in the full knowledge that BlackRock's corporate engagement robots will donkey vote through remuneration, 100%. Look at that. So Larry Fink does have a $98 million Gulfstream. You remember when uh, Jeffrey Immelt from G uh, GE, big climate change warrior, right? He didn't have one but two planes. He flew, then he had one behind him in case the other one went uh, had a problem. He had to get on the other. So he had two planes. One, he literally had a convoy of airplanes because he was so important. And so worried about climate that not just one, but two airplanes would fly uh, because of the one first one went kaput, he could go on the second one. These guys are all scumbags. I would love to see a wealth tax on these guys. Love it. Because they are hurting average Americans and average people throughout the world, man, without question. Um, no. Let's see. Larry Fink's family tree was a mystery. Let's take a look here. Oh, yeah, interesting. Uh Dateline 2021. It's very unlikely a small percentage of people even know who BlackRock is, despite the fact they are the world's largest investment firm. It's founded by Larry Fink. Um, can I get out of this thing right here? In 1998, on the corporate umbrella of Blackstone. All right. If Larry Fink is on your radar, you better start paying attention. Familiar yourself with what BlackRock is behind, what they've already done to negatively impact you and the economy, what's coming down the pike. Thankfully, Putin uh, arrested that to some regard. When a, uh, my father owned a small... So it's no mystery that there are no articles in existence stating the names of Larry Fink's parents or family members. Aside from his son Joshua, and with the exception of a 2012 article by Forbes, they must have forgotten to scrub. 
All right. Any articles, including Wikipedia, that do not mention Fink's parents or siblings all state the same thing, which is ex excerpt from his own writing that he owned a small business, a shoe store, and my mom taught English at a local university. All right. That is the extent of what the media has been allowed to disclose about Fink's family throughout the years. Huh. However, through an exhaustive amount of digging and cross-referencing through obituaries, uh, blah, 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 there was enough information to open source documents to put together a portion of Fink's family trees. After scanning countless Fink obituaries in California, his parents could be discovered. Uh, let's see. All photos used throughout this article are from public sources, Wikipedia Ancestry, the information is for researchers, uh, research purposes only. Larry Fink may not be involved in a family business of destroying the U.S. economy, so please be... Oh, any... Any any family members connected to Larry Pink may not Larry Fink may not be involved in the the business of destroying the U.S. economy. So there he is right there, Larry Fink. Huh, who's that? Father Alan Fink. Who are these people? Ellen Raskin Flanagan. Okay, so let's see who these guys are. There's his kids. Fink on the paternal side, Victor Fink. So that what's up with that guy right there? Uh, there's certainly not, okay. All right. Let's see. Parents, population census. That's interesting. Let's see. He owned a shoe store. He was a member of the Bloody Bucket Division during World War II with actions in the battles of the Bulge and Ardennes Force. His battle took place between blah, blah, blah. Looks like he was uh, drafted. Frederick A. Fink, son of Mr. and Mrs. Victor Fink, is receiving specialized training in Fort Benning. Is a 20th Division, which is known as a Keystone Division. All right, gotcha. So he's fought in World War II. All right. According to the NRA, uh, while residing in Santa Monica, Frederick and Leela Fink received a small business loan for $21,000 under the program titled Physical disaster loans, okay, after a certain federal thing can be found in 1948. I'll let you guys read for that if you're so interested. And here's his mother. After going through numerous registered shoe stores, no records can be found with Fred or Leela Fink's name on them. Uh, there were no other photos or documents even mentioning him, mentioning him after UCLA with the exception of 1993 release. In the 1994 document, that one sentence penned by Larry Fink that his dad owned a shoe store. According to his obituary, he's a war veteran who shortly after returning graduated from UCLA, met his wife, okay, and then <laughs> met his wife, raised three kids, opened a shoe store, and then traveled to over 100 countries. Yeah, that's kind of weird. All right, let's see who this is. That's That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. All right, the kids were not allowed, to, okay, and grandparents. So his granddad was born in Poland, all right. Yeah, I, you can read all this. I uh, It's just odd how we have no records of the family whatsoever. No one finds that odd? That's just kind of weird, man. Here's his, the hell is that? I don't even know. Her daughter, okay, and there's brother Stephen Fink. Looks just like him. He is sir, chairman of, okay, you can read all that. Um, Forbes 12, 2012 article on Stephen Fink that they failed to scrub. Since there's a very good chance that the Forbes article on Fee, uh, Stephen Fink will be scrubbed and the archive may be removed, below is a screenshot. All right, here's a lawyer turnaround guy. Okay. Oh, it turned out he lived next to Michael Milken. Interesting. But no reporter all these years ever fingered Fink for what he's become his neighbor. Since 1987, he's been one of Milken's most trusted, confidants and partners. And what remains a busy deal network. Milken has had his problems with the Finks, but this Fink is a guy he's relied on to fix business trouble. Huh. Fink now is chairman and executive next Terra. All right, gotcha. Uh, and that, Fink's job is to focus and convince Wall Street that next Terra is an internet play. All right. It's in many respects, it's a little different from what he's done before. He's a fix it guy. Interesting. After Anthony was sold in 1986, Fink tapped his neighbors into his neighborhood's neighbor's orbit. Steve is very good at networking, chuckles his younger brother Lawrence, a Wall Street figure at BlackRock. Fink went to work for Pacific Asset Holdings, run by Gary Winnick, 
later to emerge as Global Crossing. He helped reposition hospital operator Republic Health, eventually sold to what is now Tenant Healthcare. Anyway, the point being is, uh, true to form, Fink saw nothing wrong with Nextera's assets, which includes such consulting powerhouses as uh, <laughs> Lexicon, home of Merton Miller, and two other Nobel laureates. A bunch of other, uh, the point being is, you can see a mile away, man that these guys are running with some pretty shady people, all funding the fascist takeover of the world with green technology, or green energy, I should say, which is going to make you poorer and them richer. As I tell you, is what they want. Oh, you're a conspiracy. It's not even a conspiracy. They, they are absolutely conspiracy, conspiring. I got no qualm with that. It's not a theory. It's a fact, dude. It's a fact. They want you poorer. They want you living in rat freaking cages in these inner cities they don't want you freaking be able to drive a car fly a plane but they certainly will and for putin to stand up which is crazy because the freaking putin was financing some of these guys which is nuts so he could put germany up against it that's why germany can't compete and they fell for it <laughs> so there is a uh, a measure of satisfaction knowing that people are finally starting to wake up to the impossibility of these just falsehoods. Now, at the end of the day, I, I don't like big oil anymore. I tell you that right now, but I like big oil a hell of a lot better than like big cream. But if you think big oil is free from the hell, no, man. We know in the Exxon Mobil, uh, Exxon Mobil, yeah, I guess Exxon uh, shareholder meeting that uh, was it now 21 Jump Street or some stupid clown show, you know, they got three of their board of directors on there on the three of their guys on the board of directors because we know the proxy votes that Larry Fink and Vanguard have. These are all, these aren't capitalists, man. These are bad people who want to engage, are engaging in bad activities and they're scared because Putin's saying no more. And yet, as we'd say as a Russian stooge, right? And yet, he said, no, you guys pushed me too far. I was in on it. Now I hold the upper hands. I, uh, and again, I feel bad for the Ukrainian people who are going to suffer. I also feel bad for the Russian people because the Ukrainians been shelling Russia's, you know, the eastern part of Ukraine for freaking eight years, killing like twelve to 15,000 people, if not more. The Russians who are just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the Russians are going to kill innocent Ukrainians. It sucks. But you know what else sucks? Is the whole world falling, just, just falling under the spell of green energy. It's just it, because they got the money. So anyway, it sucks, but... Out of bad things, good things can happen. I think this is what's happening now. All right, we'll hear you. I'm sure many of you all have subscribed, but that's got to do what you got to do. We'll see you.